Thank you all for being here. I'm Eleanor Ganyan. I work for the Just Transition Collective and am part of the Alaska Climate Alliance's Policy Working Group. Um, today we'll be talking about how we can all join together in creating a more just and vibrant economy for Alaska. Two weeks ago, the ACA published a new report titled Learning to Thrive, Alaska's Next Economy in a Warming World. The goal was to provide policy recommendations that will move Alaska towards a more regenerative economy, as well as show that it is possible. Today, we'll be discussing the report, but also placing it in the context of existing initiatives and the 2024 legislative session. Um, before we begin, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. I'm new to Alaska, so I'll talk about my home first. I grew up on the falsely ceded lands of Anishinaabe Aking in Gichinama Binin Zabing, or what is now known as Marquette, Michigan. For all who live there, whether they know it or not, Anishinaabe culture pervades our lives. We live on the shores of Gichigame, or Lake Superior, one of the largest freshwater lakes in the world. Its size is hard to describe unless you've seen it, and every single person I know has a profound respect for it. It is our teacher. It provides us with our livelihoods. It feeds us, and it gives us mountains of lake effect snow that were amazing to play in as a kid, but a nightmare to shovel. I grew up on its shores, but only learned its indigenous name in high school history class. Marquette is a place where indigenous culture is everywhere, in place names, in our attitudes towards the lakes and the trees, and yet I had never experienced someone giving a land acknowledgement until moving to Fairbanks, located on the ancestral lands of the Lower Tanana Dene peoples, where I'm now sitting. This practice has become very valuable to me, as I believe it connects us all more closely to one another and to the land where we work and grow and learn. So I'd like to thank the Anishinaabe people who have and continue to advocate for and protect the land that nourished me as I grew up, and the Dene peoples who have worked so hard to preserve their culture and ancestral lands that nourish me now. I'd like to take a moment for us all to remember on whose lands we have the privilege of living and the joys that the land has given you. All right, thank you all for being here today, wherever it is you might be, and let's get started. Um, today, we will start with a new report from the ACA and then move to our speakers. We have an amazing panel of speakers who will be talking about existing programs and initiatives that are already doing the work and others who will place this in the context of the 2024 legislative session. This year is gonna be a big one for us with a lot of major bills that could create some real positive change on the roster. 2024 has the potential to be the year for shifting public opinion away from fossil fuels and towards a more just and regenerative economic system. After that, we'll have time for a short Q&A session moderated by my co-host, Kay Brown from Pacific Environment, followed by a few calls to action for those looking for opportunities for deeper involvement in the regenerative economy space. Um, before we get started, I wanted to give a shout out to our co-hosts, the Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition, the Alaska Economic Vision Coalition, and Pacific Environment, without whom this webinar would not have been, would not have been possible. I also would like to give a special recognition to Jessica Wright, who designed the report, and Alyssa Quintine and Scott Clint Daniel, who made the art in the report and that you see on the slides. Um, I also wanted to give special recognition to Representative Elise Galvin, who is also here with us today. And then finally, just a few logistics. If you would like, please rename yourself with your pronouns and org. And if you have any questions as the webinar progresses, just write them in the Q&A. It's on the little box at the bottom and Kay will save them for the Q&A portion at the end. Also, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted after the event on our website, alaskanexteconomy.com, where you can also find our report, Learning to Thrive, Alaska's Next Economy in a Warming World. And with that, we can get started. Um, the webinar was inspired by our new report, um, which we published two weeks ago. With this report, we aim to show that not only is creating an alternative to our current extractive economic model possible, but will also improve the lives of Alaska residents. As the climate crisis worsens, we are faced with compounding ecological disasters and two competing responses have emerged. The one we see most often is simply continuing our dependence on a boom and bust extractive economy that benefits outside corporations at the expense of Alaskans and the state's environment. And the other is ours, a just transition that envisions a regenerative economy, a system that would reshape social and environmental justice, enhance social 
local community self-determination, reduce climate wrecking emissions, and is based on the understanding that indigenous ways of knowing are the foundation of a sustainable future. Learning to Thrive outlines how Alaska can achieve a sustainable and economically vibrant future and transition away from fossil fuel dependence to a regenerative economy. It highlights the promising economic opportunities that are the foundations upon which a prosperous and regenerative economic, regenerative economy can be built. These are renewable energy, broadband access, care economies, education and workforce development, tourism, outdoor recreation, agriculture, mariculture, fisheries, mining, and mining. Um, we added mining as is becoming more prominent due to the critical minerals needed to build the technology for the transition. We recognize that facing the climate crisis can feel overwhelming, but we also demonstrate the many positive actions that we can take today to combat them, which are detailed in each section. Our report argues that amid this crisis, we have the opportunity to re-envision what Alaska looks like and achieve a more just and regenerative economy. The climate crisis requires urgency, but also presents opportunity. We hope that it will convince Alaska legislators and residents to advocate for policies that will allow our state to grow in the metrics that matter, human welfare, health, happiness, and community stability. It shows that together we can build a more resilient and robust economy to ensure that all Alaska residents have the ability to thrive. Today, we'll only be covering a few of the topics covered in the report, um, renewable energy, care economies, agriculture and food security, and mining. We'll finish with a discussion of the current legislature and the opportunities we have to enact change this session. Um, and don't forget that if you have any questions as our speakers are presenting, just put them in the Q&A and we will try to get them, get to them at the end. Our first speaker today is Lila Hobbs, the Energy Justice Lead at Native Movement. She has been working on supporting energy sovereignty, particularly for Alaska Native tribes. Um, and she'll be sharing how this is a key component of a regenerative economy. Thank you, Lila. Thanks so much, Eleanor. <clears throat> I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you today. Um, just grounding the discussion, I wanted to talk a little bit about what tribal energy sovereignty is. And so um, for me, when I'm uh, discussing it, it, it is this concept that is deeply rooted in a broader principle um, of tribal sovereignty. Um, and tribal sovereignty recognizes the inherent rights of indigenous people to self-governance and self-determination. And so tribal energy sovereignty um, for me means the tribes and indigenous communities choose how to generate power to sustain their communities. They have control over their energy production, consumption, decision-making decision processes um, that are related to energy development. Um, and so tribal energy sovereignty and a regenerative economy, they go hand in hand. Um, the relationship uh, between tribal energy sovereignty and regenerative economies is very closely intertwined and they're mutually reinforcing ideas. They're rooted in these shared principles of sustainability, um, holistic resource management and community well-being. Um, and both of these concepts emphasize the interconnectedness of social, economic, and environmental systems. So um, with that in mind, I want to talk about a situation that um, is happening in Antioch. Um, Native Movement, my organization, got an invitation um, from the tribe in Antioch, Antioch Traditional Council, um, to help with a energy-related issue. Um, something <laughs> that we saw, uh, uh, which was happening, is that in Antioch um, last year, and I've highlighted some of these headlines that you might have seen um, from last June um, through this fall, is that uh, Antioch is experiencing an issue of not having tribal energy sovereignty. And I want to talk about how that has panned out um, and why this issue is just so important. So um, last year, Antioch um, Light and Power is a privately owned utility in Antioch. 
And um, they filed for what are called um, uh, cost of power adjustments, COPAs, and they filed these to the Regulatory Commission of Alaska. And um, and the Regulatory Commission of Alaska decided that it did not need to give any public notice about a rate increase um, to ratepayers in ANIAC. And so how this panned out is that um, come June of 2023, uh, ratepayers in ANIAC opened their regular energy um, bills. And what ended up being uh, typically a $200 bill was an $800 bill. So they had... Um, these quadrupled power bills um, without any notice. And so that's where um, my organization and many other organizations um, kind of came in support of the tribe. And what ended up happening is this incredible grassroots mobilization effort um, working towards tribal energy sovereignty. sovereignty. Uh, we formed what's called the ANIAC Energy Steering Committee started meeting uh, every week. Um, we've been meeting bi-weekly since about June of 2023. And it's made up of residents in Antioch, um, the tribe, and uh, many different organizational members. And what ended up happening is that we saw a breakdown um, in, uh, in not only in the leadership of the RCA to not give public notice about um, uh, folks' as energy um, bills increasing so much, uh, but we really saw that there was a lack of um, care for um, folks in rural and remote communities who often have these extremely high energy burdens. Um, so the ANIAC Energy Steering Committee decided to do something about it. They wrote a resolution calling for change, um, statutory changes, and calling for change within the RCA itself and uh, realizing that we needed Alaska Native um, and tribal representation um, in the RCA to make sure that this doesn't happen in other communities. We don't want what happened in Antioch to ever happen again. It should never happen in the first place. And so this resolution went before the Association of Village Council Presidents at their annual convention. It passed unanimously. Um, and uh, from the ABCP, uh, that resolution was then introduced at AFN, and that resolution passed unanimously. Um, these are incredible efforts in which regular citizens can get involved and say, this system is not working for us. And I think it goes to show that we can truly re-envision what Alaska looks like and regular citizens can get involved in this and we can call for changes. I just wanna highlight some of the more recent, um, uh, these are all headlines from uh, newspapers um, across Alaska. And so these resolutions are calling for change and um, and we, uh, members of the ANIAC Steering Committee have been um, reaching out to legislators and having informational meetings about what that change could look like and why um, when tribes have um, energy sovereignty, they really are able to best care for their community. They understand the land, they understand the needs, and um, when they can care for their communities, um, that provides that much more energy security for the future. And I think um, it is all about having secure energy futures. So thank you so much for your time. And that's just a little case study in what's going on in Antioch. Oh, and sorry, <laughs> let me just share. Um, here's one photo um, uh, that you can see of um, Wayne Morgan, who has been really integral in this um, ANIAC Energy Steering Committee. He's on the left um, in the middle is council member um, Leonard Morgan uh, from ANIAC. And on the right is the second chief, Bruce Morgan. And they're the three of them holding um, the resolution that passed unanimously at AFN. So this is a huge community win. Um, and we're really proud of the efforts um, that they have put forward and the tremendous leadership that they have um, provided along this process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you. I'm really glad you were able to join us and share what's going on in ANIAC. It's really exciting work. Um, next, we have Andrea Androshko. 
Andrea is an assistant professor of business administration, health occupation, and health sciences at the Alaska Pacific University in Anchorage. She's passionate about redefining conventional Western and American perspectives on health and strongly believes that we need to evolve our understanding of health to encompass a more comprehensive, inclusive view that recognizes the interconnectedness of health determinants. Her work is aimed at educating future healthcare professionals and, and inspiring a societal transformation in how health is perceived and managed. Today, she's going to discuss what all of that this means for the care economy in Alaska. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for the invite and the opportunity. So as we explore the transformative potential of a regenerative economy in Alaska, I urge us to broaden our perspective on what constitutes the care economy. Beyond mere access to medical services, the care economy envelops a more holistic vision of health, one that aligns with the World Health Organization's assertion that health is not just the absence of disease, but a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. So this holistic view is embodied in the eight dimensions of wellness adopted by the uh, National Institutes of Health. Um, these are the emotional, environmental, financial, intellectual, occupational, physical, social, and spiritual. Uh, these dimensions remind us that health extends far beyond hospital walls. It is rooted in every aspect of our lives. So here lies a stark contrast between the U.S. approach to health care and that of other countries with universal health care coverage. The U.S. predominantly channels its health care spending into medical care. Um, and we also are significantly uh, spend significantly more money on medical care than any other country in the world. In contrast, nations with universal health care allocate significant resources to supporting the broader dimensions of wellness, including key social determinants of health, such as housing, food, and economic security. This approach not only fosters a healthier population, but is also more cost effective in the long run and aligns with the foundational principles of a regenerative economy. In Alaska, we stand at a crossroads. We can continue down the path of isolated medical-centric health policies, or we can choose a more integrated route, one that embraces all dimensions of wellness. As we deliberate on policies for our regenerative economy, let us consider how our decisions can support not just the physical health of Alaskans, but their emotional, occupational, and social well-being too. So it's time to redefine our health policies. Let's shift our focus from short-term medical interventions to long-term holistic health strategies. By doing so, we not only align with the World Health Organization's vision, but also pave the way for a healthier, more sustainable Alaska. And in this transformative journey, we must also shine a light on the often invisible yet invaluable role of at-home caregivers. Whether caring for children or the elderly, these individuals embody the very essence of a care economy, Ironically, while we recognize the economic value of paid caregiving services, we often overlook the contributions of family members who provide these services at home by choosing, if it is in fact a choice, uh, to be at-home caregivers, they are paradoxically seen as having left the workforce despite performing work of immense social value. Um, in a regenerative economy, it is imperative to dismantle barriers that prevent at-home caregivers from receiving due recognition and benefits such as health insurance and maybe even social security quarter of coverage credit. Acknowledging and supporting these caregivers is not just a moral imperative. It's a strategic move uh, to address the caregiver shortage and reinforce the fabric of our community. While there is a nationwide shortage of caregivers, this problem is exceptionally stark in Alaska. I cannot overemphasize how detrimental the lack of assisted living and nursing home beds is to our state. Where do we expect our elders to live when they cannot safely live independently? Of more direct importance, the lack of nursing home and assisted living beds means that our hospitals cannot discharge between 70 and 100 individuals every day because they do not have access to a caregiver in their own home. That discharge backlog directly impacts our hospitals and their ability to accept new patients. Our short-sightedness in funding senior services reverberates in every corner of our state. 
Finally, as if to add insult to injury, while our average monthly cost for assisted living is only about one and a half times the national average, the cost of nursing home care is more than three times the national average, more than twice the next most expensive state, Connecticut, and six times more expensive than the least expensive state, Missouri. At this rate, even the most well-off individual will burn through their savings within a short time and become yet another senior dependent on Medicaid to cover their cost of care. Equally important is the advancement of education and workforce development, as highlighted in the Learning to Thrive report. Uh, this report underscores the need for culturally-based trauma-informed education across K-12, post-secondary, and trade levels. Such an approach is not just about academic success, it aligns perfectly with the eight dimensions of wellness, fostering a well-rounded, resilient, and thriving populace. Uh, they are not just economic drivers, but foundational elements of a healthy and longer lived society. Investing in these areas is investing in the long-term well-being of our people. Alaska has begun to address these needs with a growing number of workforce development initiatives, particularly in healthcare occupations, being offered even in remote locations. This is commendable, but is just the start. We must continue to expand and innovate in how we deliver education and training, ensuring that it is accessible and relevant to all Alaskans, regardless of their location or background. Uh, so in closing, as we deliberate on the future of Alaska's economy, let us embrace a holistic, inclusive vision, one that values caregivers, champions education and workforce development, and sees health in its broadest, most inclusive form. This is the path to a truly regenerative economy, one that nurtures every aspect of our society and leads to sustained well-being and prosperity for all Alaskans. And thank you very much. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Um, if anyone has any questions for Andrea or for Lila, uh, please add them in the Q&A. Uh, next up, we have Claire Marshalek, the co-director of the Alaska Farmers Market Association, or AFMA. Her work is founded in a firm belief in a food secure future built by regenerative agriculture. At AFMA, she works in local food to build deep connections with community and promote growth from the ground up. She's here to share the work the Alaska Farmers Market Association has been doing to support food security with us. Um, AFMA is an example of the type of advocacy and grassroots work that creates tangible change. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Eleanor. I want to thank you all for welcoming me today. I'm honored to be here today representing Alaska Farmers Market Association. We are a statewide 501c3 focused on supporting Alaska's farmers markets. When we reference farmers markets, we are including traditional farmers markets, um, CSAs, or community supported agriculture, food hubs, farm stands, direct marketing farmers, and specialty produce markets. In this regard, AFMA is unique. It is not typical for state associations to recognize all these avenues as markets. Um, however, at AFMA, we acknowledge that our local food system is built from the ground up and that traditional farmers markets may not work in rural communities. Because of this, we support and uplift all avenues in which local food um, is feeding Alaskans. Today, our directory recognizes 65 markets statewide, and we're hopeful that this will only continue to grow. We have a vision. Our goal at AFMA is to nourish resilient communities by increasing access to local food, bolstering local, local economies, providing technical assistance opportunities to farmers markets and direct marketing farmers, offering tolls and funding opportunities, and advocating for a more equitable food system. Our local food economy, as mentioned, is built from the ground up. AFMA is working on a number of projects that lower the cost and remove barriers to local food. The AFMA Market Match Program provides SNAP authorized farmers and farmers markets with the opportunity to amplify SNAP customers' purchasing power. Consider $40 in SNAP benefits now buys $80 worth of local produce. Additionally, this program provides WIC customers with an additional $15 in market coupon. On the other hand, our local food purchasing or LFPA program um, supports farmers and community through a farm to food bank model where farmers markets purchase local food from their farmers at full market price, then deliver the local food to anti-hunger groups. 
These programs are only possible with the support of our farmers markets and the work of our farmers. AFMA's Beginning and Young Farmers Network seeks to empower the next generation of farmers to succeed and steward the land and waters while feeding Alaskans for generations to come. The network is a space to gather and share for all those entering the farming sector. These programs are producing benefits that stretch across communities. In 2023, over $12,000 in SNAP was matched ship markets. $23,000 in produce was purchased from farmers market from farmers with WIC farmers market vouchers. $90,000 in local food was delivered to food banks, elder programs, soup kitchens, and other anti-hunger groups. More than 36 farmers sold to the local food purchasing program. So these programs go beyond feeding our communities. They reinforce local economies, support our farmers, and build a stronger, more regenerative cycle. In early February, um, AFMA, my colleague Megan, will represent um, AFMA and join the Alaska Food Coalition and the Alaska Food Policy Council during Food Security Week in Juneau. We will present um, our 2023 successes during a lunch and learn, participate in legislative meetings, and continue to advocate for equitable food systems on the community and state level. I want to acknowledge that this effort is not possible um, to do alone. AFMA is not acting alone. Our vision for the future is collaborative and strengthened from the ground up with support of farmers, farmers markets, and other state local food groups. So I want to thank you all um, for being here today and learning of our work. Thank you. I think I missed a slide for you. I'm sorry about that. That's okay, Anna. Um, all right. Next up, we have Pam Miller. She's the founder and executive director of the Alaska Community Action on Toxics, or ACAT. She's a passionate advocate for environmental and rep reproductive justice, health, and human rights. She's been working for more than 35 years in environmental protection and focusing particularly on pollutants emitted by mining and other extractive industries. Today, she's going to speak about the state of mining in Alaska and what has to happen for us to reach a regenerative economy and where mining belongs in that future. Thank you so much, Pam. Thank you, Eleanor, and good afternoon, everybody. It's really good to be with all of you. And I want to give a big thanks to Eleanor and Kay for the great report and also organizing this webinar, which I'm also honored to be a part of. This is just a, a, a slide a little bit about our work. Um, we are an environmental health and justice organization that works statewide to prevent harm from extractive industries, as well as the long range transport of chemicals into the Arctic. And we do this through community-based research, education, organizing advocacy, and trying to create change at all levels. So this is just um, a kind of an overview of, of some of the issues with mining in Alaska. And I recently had an opinion editorial in the Anchorage Daily News that, that it's really a myth that there is adequate mm. uh, regulatory and oversight of mining in Alaska. And I think this slide points to the problem really that at all of the five major mines in Alaska, They've all experienced one major spill and accidental releases. Four of the five mines failed to capture or control contaminated mine water. And I won't go through all of these, but this is in a report that we did with Earthworks, SEAC, uh, Northern Center, and a number of other groups that released this investigation, really, of the regulatory and compliance history of the major mines in Alaska. And I think it really busts the myth of adequate oversight and the fact that mining is somehow sustainable. And then another uh, 2022 report, and I, I have the links for all of these at the end, um, found that there were over 8,000 spills with these five mines between 1995 and 2020. So these are really significant um, damages that create threats not only to the environment, but to to human health, because the toxic metals that are being released from these mines are, are very much threats to community health. This is an overview, and, and some of you may be familiar with the EPA's toxics release inventory that, that shows that metals mining 
is the largest source of toxic releases in the U.S. and certainly here in Alaska. And Red Dog Mine in Northwest Alaska is at the very top of the list. And you can see here the huge quantities of toxic releases, mostly in the form of toxic metals like lead, zinc, copper, mercury, that have been released just from the Red Dog Mine. And these are just some of the health effects of, of some of the major toxic metals that are released in the mining process. You can see that these include um, the fact that some of these chemicals are carcinogenic, some like lead and and mercury are neurotoxic at extremely low levels, such that there's really no safe level of exposure, and especially to children. So these are major public health issues. So one of the things I wanna stress here is that the need for so-called critical minerals should not be used as a cover for a gift to the mining industry and weakening community and environmental protection. This should not be a compromise. We need to protect community health. So there are some recommendations here and I won't go into all of them in detail. There's some great new reports by Earthworks concerning the fact that uh, reuse and recycling uh, can, can replace the need for a lot of additional new mining and that it's, I think, an important message here is that mining damages to water quality are frequently forever. And toxic metals, as I mentioned, threaten the lands, waters, and human health. Uh, it's, so it's, it's really important right now as we're transitioning to a renewable and regenerative e economy to focus, on, to focus on investing in not only much better oversight of the mining process, but to invest in robust recycling programs and to achieve mineral security that way, rather than burdening unnecessarily communities that have these, these metals in close proximity. Um, so ensuring that minerals are sourced responsibly, I think it's really important that pre free prior informed consent is, is enacted to protect the health of communities. And again, there's some good resources here and I gave the, the link with Earthworks. And a couple of quotes here, one from Austin Masek from Native Movement who uh, lives and his community is affected in Northwest Alaska by the proposed graphite one mine and Bonnie Gestring from Earthworks. Yes, and here are just some additional resources um, from Earthworks about the, the falsehood of critical and strategic minerals, a blog that we posted and we had a webinar as part of our collaborative on health and the environment uh, very recently, uh, the, the opinion editorial and a couple of new reports and just striving for just and clean energy and the importance of that. So thank you again, really great to see everybody. Thank you so much, Pam. Uh, mining is a major obstacle facing us and it really has to be discussed for us to be able to move forward. All right. Our last speaker is Diani Chapman, the State Director of Alaska Environment, which is a statewide nonprofit environmental advocacy group working on issues relating to clean air and water, open space, and a livable climate. She lives on Denina land in Anchorage, and today she's here to put all of what we just learned, heard, into the context of this year's legislature. There are a lot of promising bills on the roster this year, so she can't highlight all of them, but I encourage you to follow up with the Alaska Climate Alliance, the Alaska Center, or Alaska Environment, as they're all maintaining bill trackers and hoping to get some really positive work done this se session. Thank you so much, Diani. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, and thank you, Kay, so much. Uh, this has been such a great web webinar so far. Um, as Eleanor mentioned, um, as a touch of background, the shift to a regenerative economy won't happen in one fell swoop. Um, instead, the transition is made up of many incremental steps and decisions that are all informed by the larger vision. And the legislature is considering, considering a slew of bills that will impact the shape and objectives of Alaska's future economy and how fast we get there. 
I mean, I'm just going to talk about a couple of the bills because I don't have time to talk about all of them, uh, but definitely worth keeping track of the legislative session as a whole and reach out um, if you're curious to get more info. Um, so not an exhaustive list, just a sample. Um, I want to start by talking a little bit about energy. Um, so this session has the potential to bring about some really big steps forward in the transition to a in tr transition to renewable energy. Um, the rail belt has a short-term deadline uh, to make some changes due to the current state of gas extraction in Cook Inlet. I um, mean, there's a lot of money available from the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the Inflation Reduction Act. And this means that folks who aren't necessarily prioritizing climate change and the environment are excited about renewables can bring to the table as well, uh, which means that we've got a lot of momentum. And um, we'll talk about the renewable portfolio standard first, which is on the next slide here. Um, so Senator Tobin and Rep Sumner have introduced matching bills, uh, which would require the rail belt utilities to generate 25% of their electricity from renewable sources by 2027, 50% uh, by 2035, and 80% by 2040. I mean, this would obviously make a huge impact on the energy landscape of Alaska. And there's sort of two key components of this bill that I think are really important. Uh, the first is momentum. And those first handful of projects are always the hardest to get off the ground, um, especially um, in a state that has a lot of things that are different than other places with our seasonal cycles. Um, and so really getting started will have so much impact. So that 25% goal is really important. Um, the other reason why this bill um, is really valuable is golden goals and standards hold utilities accountable. Um, there's all of this federal money that's available right now. Um, and by having those standards and goals and those set deadlines, it just ensures that folks are actually taking the steps to get us there. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is the Green Bank Bill. Um, so Senator, or, so not Senator, Governor Dunleavy has introduced a bill that would establish a Green Bank. I mean, a green bank allows both individuals and rural utilities to obtain low interest loans for improving efficiency and in installing renewable energy infrastructure. Um, so the Inflation Reduction Act, it includes a bunch of different tax credits and rebate programs for folks that are looking to add rooftop solar, add battery storage systems, electric heat pumps um, to their homes. And in order for us to truly transition away from dirty fuels, we need to electrify our homes so that they can run on renewable energy once we get our grid to transition. And then we also need to improve efficiency. Uh, the cleanest energy will always be the energy that we never use. And some of those rebate programs are point of sale, but for things like home weatherization, folks have to front the whole amount and then they get the rebate back on the next tax cycle. Um, and so the rebate programs, they're really designed for folks who are more low, median income, and then the tax credits for those who have higher uh, financial resources. Um, and if you don't have a huge amount of income, it can be really hard to front money for large projects like that. And a green bank can ease the way and help our rural utilities also take advantage of infrastructure grants that need matching funds. Um, I've got a couple of resources that I'll put in the chat um, that has information about heat pumps, rooftop solar and storage, uh, winter weatherization and efficiency. So you can read more about that too. Um, and I'll do that once I'm finished talking. Um, and then another way for more folks, uh, we can go to the next slide here. Um, another way for more folks to enjoy the benefits of renewable energy is through community solar. Um, so Senator uh, Wilkowski introduced a bill on that. And not everyone has the right roof for solar panels or owns their own roof or has the capital to invest in solar panels themselves. I mean, community solar is an easy solution that allows folks to invest in a portion of a local project along with other people in their area and then share the benefits. And then long term, this can also turn regular folks into energy producers. I mean, that can ensure livelihoods for more people as we move away from extractive industries. Um, I want to talk a little bit about annual net metering. Uh, so this is something uh, that it looks like it's going to be included in the community solar bill. And this also might pop up in a couple other places um, this legislative session. Uh, but we need to make it easier for people to reap the financial rewards of solar power overall. Um, so a little background, uh, when individuals have solar on their roof, their electric bills decrease because they only pay for the energy that they consume beyond what their panels produce. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. And then net metering adds an additional benefit where folks are compensated for the surplus electricity that they contribute to the grid. Right now in Alaska, this is done on a monthly basis. So during the summer when people overproduce and in the spring when people overproduce a lot of energy, oftentimes um, they can sell that surplus back to the utility and it will pay them um, the wholesale rate for that electricity. 
Um, and then during the darker winter months, when they're not necessarily producing enough electricity to cover their needs, um, they pay the customer price uh, for electricity. If we switch that to an annual net metering, um, oftentimes what folks produce in the spring and summer will cover a lot of their winter electricity needs, and that will make it so that people can pay off their bills or their solar panel arrays faster and make it so more people are ready to invest in the technology. Um, so it's really key to the transition. Um, it will also create another mechanism for livelihood beyond non-renewable extractive industries. So I think that's important too. Um, the last thing I wanna spend a minute on is right to repair. Um, so when I think about regenerative economies, there's a couple guidelines that I keep in mind. Um, the first is that you should exploit renewable resources no faster than they can be regenerated. You should deplete non-renewable resources no faster than alternatives can be developed. And you should emit waste no faster than it can be assimilated by ecosystems. Electronics is the fastest growing waste stream in the world right now, and it's rough on the environment start to finish. Um, mining, we just talked about, um, it can be a really huge problem. Um, greenhouse gas emissions from the production of electronics is really significant. Um, and then there's uh, e-waste is a particularly toxic form of waste as well. And as I mentioned, we need to be electrifying more of our lives. We can heat our homes that way, et cetera. And so it's more important than ever that we develop a circular economy for our electronics. And one of the first and more, most important steps in that is repair, is making it so we can repair our electronics and use them for much longer than we do right now. Um, currently, manufacturers will often monopolize repair of their products. So they'll withhold spare parts, tools, and information for repair, making it really expensive so that you're inclined to just buy new instead. And this happens with everything from cell phones to tractors, so really broad range of items. Um, this bill that was introduced by Senator Dunbar would require original equipment manufacturers to release those repair necessities to folks at a fair and reasonable price. Um, and this is especially important for rural communities who don't have access to those manufacturers to fix things as well. Um, so I'll wrap up by saying, um, just reminding you all that there's definitely other legislation that will impact our future economy in Alaska. Um, and I encourage you to make your voices heard throughout the session on these examples and um, the others and keep in touch if you've got additional questions. Um, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Diani. Um, and to all our other speakers, um, there's a lot of positive action occurring in Alaska these days, and the bills highlighted by Diani will be a huge steps forward for Alaska if passed. However, getting the legislature to act is not always an easy task, and so it's up to us to be annoying, to sign petitions, to call our legislature, and to make our um, voices heard. Um, so yeah, now we'll take about 15 minutes for some questions for our speakers. Kay will moderate this uh, Q&A session working from questions left for us in the Q&A box. If you have any and haven't written any down, feel free to do so now. Um, we don't have too many at the moment, but if there's anything you'd like to know, uh, please put in the Q&A. I will also mention that everything that's been shared so far um, will be shared along with the slides um, in a follow-up email. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Eleanor. Hello, everyone. I'm Kay Brown, and I want to thank all the speakers for their excellent information. And uh, hopefully we can pool our energy and our resources together and encourage our lawmakers to take these issues seriously and to begin advancing the actions we need for a regenerative economy. So um, I want to start by asking Lila Hobbs a question. She was talking about tribal energy sovereignty and just what opportunities, Lila, do you see for statewide measures that could improve the situation? What needs to be happening? Thanks, Kay. That's an excellent question. You know, I think that there are some really exciting developments um, that have already happened, particularly in the Northwest Arctic Borough, um, uh, uh, like in communities Shungnak and Kovac. Um, they have a community solar project in which um, the tribe, uh, two tribes have come together to become independent power producers. Um, and so that basically means that they're the tribe is selling power to an isolated microgrid. Um, and these communities are um, historically, they've been heavily reliant on um, expensive diesel fuel um, to provide power. Um, and uh, this project in particular, you know, it has aimed to 
stabilize the cost of electricity and allow communities to take charge of their energy futures. And so um, we're seeing more and more instances of uh, tribes becoming IPPs, independent power producers, and owning that energy resource. And I think um, the Northwest Arctic Borough certainly provides a roadmap uh, for other communities to do that. The ANIAC Energy Steering Committee, um, that idea uh, largely is influenced from the Northwest Arctic Borough and the Energy Steering Committee that they still have in place there today. It's been in existence for many years. Um, and so I think there's a lot of ways that communities around the state can look um, at these existing roadmaps for um, not only influencing energy related decisions and the decision making processes, um, but also shifting and looking at how tribes can um, have ownership of their energy resources and, and then um, and ultimately have the say in their energy futures and securing um, a renewable clean energy futures uh, for their communities instead of this um, continuum of being uh, heavily reliant on diesel fuel and and whatnot. So I think there's a lot of exciting movement going on, and um, and we need to recognize and celebrate uh, the wins that are already occurring, um, and really look to um, giving ownership back to tribes to make their energy decisions. Thank you. Well, I don't see any more questions in the chat, so I think I'll turn it back to Eleanor. We have some more information to present about calls to action and things that you can do right now to get involved and to help encourage our lawmakers to take action. Yeah, thanks, Kay. Um, so we actually have quite a few. Um, first, I'll start with the Just Transition Summit. So I work for the Just Transition Collective. And this coming March, the collective will be hosting its bi-yearly Just Transition Summit. If you're interested in environmental protection, social justice, regenerative economies, or simply improving lives, you should join us. It's March 18th to 20th and will be hosted in Juneau. It will also have an extra day on the 21st for lobbying. If you'd like more information, uh, check out the website. It'll be linked in the chat. But again, all of these resources will be shared in a follow-up email. And then I'd like to turn to Dia. Diani to talk a little bit about engaging our legislature late tours. Right. Uh, so I mentioned a couple different pieces of legislation um, and definitely always the best way to engage legislators is to call or send individual emails uh, to them asking them to support or oppose or modify uh, particular legislation. Um, those personal comments are really valuable. Um, however, it can sometimes be really helpful to uh, have some sample language, uh, or sometimes you don't have time to do that for all of them. Um, and so we've got a couple links uh, for ways that you can send quick emails, and you can modify the emails um, around the Renewable Energy Portfolio Standard, the Community Solar Bill, and the Digital Right to Repair Act. So, um, so we'll put those links in the chat, um, and you definitely should reach out to your legislators and ask them to support and prioritize all of those bills. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, and in keeping with legislative actions you can take today, um, FCAC's working group King, or Keep It in the Ground, is circulating a petition asking state legislators to fundamentally reform Alaska's oil and gas tax codes and supporting Senate Bill 114. Um, if passed, Senate Bill 114 will be a major step towards ending oil and gas subsidies and transitioning to the labor force and elect um transitioning the labor force and electric grid towards renewable energy. Link in the chat, but also will be shared. Um, yeah, and then on the topic of subsidies, um, the House Resources Committee will be having a hearing on the Cook Inlet gas subsidy bills on January 31st at 1 p.m. You can find out more about the timing and the bills in the link um, that will be shared. And yeah, submit a testimony or show up to the hearing and make your voice heard. This is a really important bill. Um, and then finally about legislation, um, if you'd like to learn more about energy legislation specifically, um, join FCAC's King Group and Renewable Energy Working Group um, and their energy analysts for a breakdown of the bills they are tracking this session. 
And I saw some questions about who has the bill trackers. And that is the Alaska Climate Alliance, Alaska Environment, and the Alaska Center. So if you want to find more about what bills we're tracking, go there. But again, I'll share all of this in um, a follow-up email. Eleanor, I just wanted to add one other note about Senate Bill 114, the uh, oil and gas bill to um, close up some loopholes in our tax system. It's obvious that the state really needs the money to support education and other public services. And one of the most significant things that we could do right now is close those loopholes and stop so much subsidy to fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are the heart of the climate crisis. And so as an initial step, we definitely should take a close look at uh, Senate Bill 114, encourage our legislators to act to both get more money into the state coffers to support public services, as well as to reduce subsidies on oil and gas. So just wanted to put in a plug for that and also say I'm uh, working with the Climate Alliance and the Policy Working Group and would be uh, happy to include anyone who's interested in those uh, conversations. Yeah, thank you so much, Kay. Um, so that is what we have for you all today. Thank you all so much for your presence and participation. I hope you're able to learn something new and are coming away excited with all the amazing work happening in this state. We are a lot of bad news every day. It's super easy to get sucked in and forget about all the good, but there is so much positive work happening and we can really create the change we want to see. Um, to get connected, feel free to check out our website, www.nexteconomy.com or email me at regenerate at fairbanksfbxclimateaction.org. You can also follow all the organizations that participated in this video on social media. And for those who didn't get the chance to look at everything shared in the chat and to get the slides and stuff, um, I will uh, be sending a follow-up email later today. Thank you again so much, and I hope to see you guys at future webinars or at the Just Transition Summit.